Hello, I'm Earl Weyenberg, and this is Book Circle Presents. This time we're continuing the cavalry cycle and continuing our reading of Bonfire Night. Deirdre held onto Vimont's jacket and congratulated herself on holding herself together. There was a moral cause to pursue and she would pursue it. Never mind that pursuit meant her first horseback ride in the dark with no saddle on a horse who was a transformed old boyfriend. It would make quite a diary entry. Were they galloping? Was this lurching galloping? She'd know if she could see it from the sidelines by daylight, but not here and now. The issue was, if this was not galloping, then he might start galloping, and that would probably be worse. Thank you for coming, Deirdre, he said. He had breath for talking. When he didn't talk, she could feel the ribs pumping in both torsos, the old one before her and the new one she rode. Sure, she answered, filthy thing to do to threaten your horse. She had never met Zelda, but she'd heard about her from Rollo. He obviously loved her the way one could love a pet dog. See the green lights, head for them. Such a dear little thing, Rollo said. He sounded like a fond father. Horses are like children to us, the captain had said. Of course, Rollo had talked that way before, too. The fairy copse was not far at a gallop. The cloud of unseasonal firefly lights came rushing up. Deirdre felt the ribcage under her inflate just before Rollo shouted amazingly loud, Mr. Chiswick, help, please! And then the thousand-pound beast under her skipped, coming far closer to spilling her than on the gallop as a voice from behind them drawled, Now this is the limit. Rollo bounced again, kicking worse and worse. Had Rollo just kicked? Twisting at neck and waist, Rollo stared fearfully over Deirdre's shoulder. Sorry, sir, he yelped. Deirdre followed his gaze and beheld, standing in his own light, a cat man in cavalry dress, the colonel. Angry. The light went out. For Rollo, he was gone. Deirdre could still see him, barely, in the dim, crowding flickers. The colonel hopped to their left and crouched low near vulnerable belly. What to do with you, he murmured or growled. Rollo jigged away from the sound, but his left arm flew up toward Deirdre. The whole mass of him was trembling. Or was that her? The colonel leapt lightly to Rollo's rump, landing on one foot. He could have breathed down on Deirdre's head, but did not stay so long. He continued the jump, landing on their right side. Rollo yelped, the noise more canine than human or equine. That foot had felt clawed, not booted. His other arm flew back and he clasped his hands, embracing Deirdre against his spine. She hugged him around his chest. Where, he began in a whisper, he's on our right, she answered. By your haunch, the colonel amplified, your round, meaty haunch. I haven't tasted horse in an age and his jaw dropped down to his chest. His canines grew into hand-length fangs. Rollo lowered his left arm. Deirdre, he whispered, go, go, if he just wants horse, or he might take the slow, weak target, Deirdre whispered back, hugging tighter. I can hear you perfectly well, the colonel put in. Deirdre ignored him. Anyway, don't you have a pact with these creatures? You told me about signs and countersigns and all. Right, he squeaked, then in that superhuman bellow called, Keep faith and so do we, the colonel sighed. That's my line, he chided. The person starting the conversation should say return and we return, and the reply is keep faith and so do we, but you just came barging in. Offing you would clearly raise the cavalry's average intelligence. Offing him would bring the pact down on us, said a new voice. Have the blood lady or the white errand on our doorstep tomorrow for you to answer to. Close your mouth, pussy, before something flies in. Who crapped in your mess kit this evening? Rollo recognized the squirrel fay from the livery stable popping out of the brush in his own halo of light. 
Mr. Chiswick, please, Zelda, th that is, uh, return and weak. Yes, yes, we're past that. What about Zelda? She's been stolen by Coy, the fawn master. Fletcher's after him. He sent me to... Chiswick swarmed out of the bracken, up Rollo's foreleg, and was suddenly between his back and Deirdre. Squirrel faces are much cuter when they are the right size and at a distance. He pointed toward the woods. She's that way. Gladly leaving the colonel behind, Rollo launched into a gallop. Deirdre was quite sure it was a gallop. Chiswick climbed on Rollo's shoulder and started shouting directions to the path entrance, which he could see apparently, though the mortals could not. Then he made an exasperated noise, waved a hand paw, and the starlight became bright enough. Rollo adjusted course. The galloping reduced to a trot once they were in the woods. Rollo, said Deirdre, call the captain and give me the phone. He obeyed. Yes, came the old centaur's voice over a rumble of hoofbeats. Captain, we've got Mr. Chiswick with us. He's tracking Zelda. Good. See if you can meet up with Darcy and Donovan on the way. Yes, sir, she said and hung up. She wondered if she should have said Roger or out or something. But Chiswick had other criticisms. Sit up straight, girl, and hold on with your knees. You ride like a sack of potatoes. Yes, sir. Sorry, sir. This is my first time. He chirped something that might have been a rodentine cuss word. Well, we must make allowances. Delahaye did not ride like a sack of potatoes. She was no standard cavalry rider, but as Darcy sped up, she changed her own rhythm to suit and sat lower. There was a gasping note to her breathing, though, that worried Darcy. As they approached the wood, Darcy turned on his phone's light, looking for the entrance to the path. His foster brother did the same a couple of hoofbeats later, and in a few seconds, so did Delahaye. Still, the lights didn't add up to much. Give me the light, Corno called, and Darcy remembered that satyrs had cat-like night vision. Here you go, Donovan said, and one of the feeble patches of light immediately picked out the path. They dove in. Empty. In the day, there were birds and squirrels, and you were almost sure to meet a fay if you spent any time in here. But the nocturnal animals stayed well away from the thunder of hooves, and all the fays apparently were partying in the copse. How uncanny was the emptiness of a wood that was not haunted. Corno and Donovan had to cooperate closely. Corno could see, but Donovan knew the way, or thought he did. It all looks so different at night, he grumbled to the satyr. Will we go wrong if we head for the lights? Corno asked. What lights? I see lights through the branches. Electric light, I think. Go for it. After two dead ends and a collision with Darcy and Delahaye as they backed up, Corno led them out of the woods into an array of big, square, boxy buildings. This is the motor pool, declared Donovan. Right. He cranked his gate up to a canter. Darcy was soon beside him, and then they were dashing through the barracks area, along the athletic field, and down the main street. Lots of lights on. Lots of people out. But the street itself was clear. Galloping time. Someone cheered as they passed. Someone whistled. Darcy heard the gasping in Delahaye's breath, and this time realized she was laughing. Then they were out of town with farmhouses and garden patches on either side, then woods again. And here was the intersection with the Silchester Road. Right or left, asked Darcy. Fletcher and Sanders would be coming in from the left, said Donovan. We're to meet them. And I see just a little light through the trees that way, added Corno. They turned left. Darcy phoned Fletcher and told them where they were. Good, said his captain. I've called the base patrols. You call your classmates. Little John and Corliss are still blissfully unaware of all this. And that other fellow with the two white legs, Dawes. Ah, I see headlights. He's going to see us, but he needn't see you. Go softly. Sneak. And leave your phone on. Yes, sir. Hooves don't have to make a lot of noise on a dirt road, if you're careful. Corno's panting was louder. May I get down, he asked. Donovan paused and knelt for him. Before Darcy could do the same for Delahaye, she slid off, then reached up, put a hand around his neck, drew his head down, and kissed him firmly on the cheek. Thank you, you beautiful boy, he heard Donovan chuckle. Quite welcome, ma'am, he answered, feeling himself blush. I don't suppose anyone has a gun, a sword, she asked hopefully. Somebody has her blood up, thought Darcy. 
Ma'am, answered Donovan, we were going to a neighbor's party, not to battle, we thought. Well, I've got a couple of knives, if that helps. Being a spellbroker must be more interesting than I realized, Donovan remarked, but Corno groaned. What's your problem? he asked. My oath. Please do not hurt him. I must try to prevent that. Getting transformed and taken doesn't count as harm, Donovan asked. I've been helping him avoid that, too. You've na made no move to help him in his horse thieving, Darcy said. He said nothing of it. He knows I would tell him it was foolish. Well, thanks for the warning, said Donovan. We're not out to hurt him. I can't say I'd mind, Darcy muttered. They proceeded in silence for a bit, and so became aware of the voices coming from their open phones. The lad was born into riches, Fletcher was saying. Money means nothing to him, but that mare does, as you know well. If he could pay your ransom, he would. He simply can't. Where is he? came Coy's voice. They rounded a curve. Lights flickered through trees, then came into plain view. Red tail lights ahead. I sent him to fetch help, of course, Fletcher answered, rather than be here presenting you with a handle. Look, you are not Grand Norman, and Fileno is not in the pact with our Fey allies, but if you turn around now and go back to Uffham, you'll be in Grand Norman territory. I might be able to call in our Fey's. They might be able to stymie Fileno. I'd still be a satyr, but you'd be free. They turned off their phones, since they could hear Fletcher directly now, and saw him and Sanders standing in the van's headlights, squinting in the glare, blocking the way. Bangs and thumps came out of the van, exactly as if it contained a frightened horse. Fletcher. It's no use, Mr. Coy. We would ransom the mare if we could, but there's just no time. If you shoot her, you have no handle. If you promise, then I'll shoot Caper and Timmy. Fletcher sighed. I know that in law that's a worse threat, but if you really had us with Zelda, here and now, just on this dark road, I care more about her. We know her. We care about her. Remember, you are dealing with talking horses. That's what we are, as much as we also remain men. You already have your best handle on us. No need to make things worse by adding hostages. Corno turned to Delahaye. Please give me a knife, he said. His voice was low and trembling, not the growl of the furious, but the quaver of the terrified. Delahaye flicked her phone beam over him, studying him. Then she reached into her coat and handed him a sheathed knife. Corno took it with a shaking hand, then bent over as if shuddering with nausea. Donovan and Darcy traded glances in the dark. The oath penalty, Donovan murmured, and Darcy nodded. Corno was breaking his oath of service to Coy. This was giving him a panic attack, but he was still doing it. Shoot her, Fletcher was saying, and you lose that handle, and we will all come down on you, and we'll see what's left for Fileno. If you promise not to shoot her or anyone else, I will promise to intercede with Fileno for you as best I can. The thumps and bangs continued. Now the door cracked open. The Foster brothers took three cautious steps toward it. Why would you care about my promise? Coy demanded. You can take an oath. It'll last through your transformation. I know about that. Or you can just promise, and I'll know if you mean it. You're receptant? Yes. I know, for instance, that you've got enchantments on your van's machinery, probably to prevent breakdowns. Good investment. I also know, because I'm receptant and because I've been his mentor for a few months, that Vimont is honest, and if he says he can't pay the ransom, he really can't. The lad's rich, but not that rich. His father is probably rich enough, but it would take him weeks, not hours, to raise the money or the vis. Mr. Coy, I'm sorry. I think it's an unduly harsh penalty for a rash bet, but you're going to turn into a satyr. I don't see how to prevent it. Coy gave a scream of rage like the one he had given when he bolted from Vimont. As if that were the signal, the back of the van burst open, and Timmy and Caper leapt out. Get back here, Coy roared, and their sprints turned into staggers, but they kept staggering. They shied from the centaurs, but gave cries of relief as they recognized Corno. He grabbed them by their upper arms and hustled them away into darkness. The young satyrs were fleeing Coy, but also Zelda's flailing hooves. They were, there were her hindquarters, kicking away, Donovan dove in beside her, intent on hauling her out. 
And there was Coy, crouched between the seats at the front of the van, face a white mask of panic, gun drawn. Donovan grabbed Zelda's head, then leaned forward toward Coy. His reasoning, if you want to call it that, Darcy said later, came from a scrap of Fletcher's teaching that blew through his mind just then. You don't need your human heart any longer, or lungs or stomach or other human viscera. You don't want to get hit at all, of course, but your reflex is to shield your original human body, while it's your new equine body you really need. And Fletcher had cited the interesting case of Heartless Harrison, whose human heart had been destroyed in combat, but who had recovered and gone on to years more service, in a more cautious frame of mind, and was with us yet. So Donovan shielded Zelda's head and his own equine body with his human torso. Just incidentally, this meant that Coy had a huge, bristling young man-monster thrusting into his face, glaring intensely. Part of Donovan was grabbing for Zelda's head and working out how she could possibly be calmed. Another part was sorting legs for the backing up and getting ready to haul Zelda out with him. And the remaining part was waiting for the bang, wondering how much it would hurt. But Coy just gasped, clutched the gun to his chest like a protective amulet, and did his own backing into the dashboard. Donovan hauled on Zelda. She stumbled and thrashed for a couple of feet, then realized that getting away was now an option, and backed with great enthusiasm. Horse and man-horse uncorked onto the road. Zelda turned away from the nightmarish box that had imprisoned her and bolted into the dark. Donovan gave a cry and started after her, but just then Coy stumbled out of the van with his own cry still holding the gun. He took in the scene lit by the van's taillights, the two young centaurs and Delahay. Of course, he breathed, I should have thought. He pointed the gun at Delahay. She glared at him. The debt would only shift to my estate, she snapped. Darcy kicked out with a foreleg and knocked the gun out of Coy's hand. It did not go far. Coy scrabbled for it, but Darcy brought a hoof down on it, then crouched down face to face with Coy. Suppose it would work. Which kind of monster would you rather be? Coy closed his eyes, dropped his head, and sighed. He sat on the dirt road, not moving, not looking up when Fletcher and Sanders came hurrying around the van. Darcy handed Fletcher the gun. Over the next two minutes, Fletcher debriefed the Foster brothers and Delahaye. Fletcher eyed Donovan. Grabbing Zelda was good strategy, but your tactics, the risk you put yourself in. Well, sir, Mr. Corno knows him well, and he said Coy wouldn't really shoot until he despaired, and I blocked the shot as well as I could. Mm, you are justified by the event, and you, Mr. Darcy, actually ended it. Well done. Sir, asked Donovan. How did you keep Coy from shooting you or Lieutenant Sanders? I made it clear early on that he had at most one shot. After that, he would have at least one, maybe two, blood enemies and no time. And I am the one who told you about Heartless Harrison. He looked down at the collapsed man simple. Mr. Coy, do you want to go back to Uffham while there is time? Try my suggestion? Coy shook his bowed head, eyes still closed. Are your fey lords here, your white and red lords and ladies, or those others? You can't summon the likes of them on short notice. And do you honestly think they would care to cross Felano over me? Fletcher sighed and said nothing, then looked up at the sound of approaching hooves. It was Vimont, bearing Deirdre, lighting their way with their phones. Next to them trotted Zelda, with Chiswick standing easily on her withers. Vimont grinned broadly as he came to a halt and saluted. Captain, Luca came trotting down the road to us. And you got him, I see, he said, looking down at Coy. Right, said Chiswick. You should have seen the state this mare was in for I put the soothing on her. Buggerin' horse thief, he snarled at Coy, using his worst insult. You're for it. And he crouched to leap off the horse. Mr. Chiswick, said Fletcher, your help has been invaluable and your wrath fully justified. But save your strength. Mr. Coy here will soon be punished most severely. He checked the time and sighed again. And I would be compelled to defend him. Corno appeared from the shadows at the side of the road, Timmy and Caper hovering behind him. 
please do not place me so. Koi raised his head and looked at his servant. Not compelled, not holy, and not any more. Nunc liberabote, I now free thee. He glanced at Caper and Timmy, at Omnibus Vobis, and all of you. Fletcher grunted, and Delahaye raised her brows, feeling the bonds snap. The young satyrs started, shifted on their feet, and stared at each other. Corno just gazed at his former master. The silence stretched into minutes. People checked the time on their phones. Eventually, Corno said to Coy, Boy, you will be more comfortable when it comes if you take off your clothes now. Coy just lowered his head again and started to weep silently. After another minute, Coy waved his hand back over his shoulder at the van that sat purring, shining its taillights on the scene. It's yours, Corno. My stuff. All of it. All of you here, bear witness. That, Corno began. Suddenly, Coy sprang to his feet. Everyone present, even the least magical, felt the shift as power went rushing, passing, draining out of the area. Fletcher, Sanders, and Donovan, standing somewhat behind Coy, saw a firefly glitter on the back of his head sparkle and fade, an Ares sign winking out. The next moment, Coy doubled over, and the next, his hands flew to his temples, where spiraling black horns, like those of the kudu antelope, were sprouting. He straightened and looked up into the dark air, gazing frantically. His ears, now pointed, swiveled, already reflexively searching for any hint of, Good evening, Mr. Coy. Everyone glanced up, following the voice. Thaleno drifted in a little ball of flame-colored light. Don't worry, you won't be a satyr long. Coy gave a cry and shrank out of his clothes. After the cloth had fluttered to the ground, a green mantis, about an inch long, crawled out of the shirt collar. It staggered as if unsure how to walk with four legs. Thaleno fluttered down and hovered before the mantis's face, no longer wobbling in the air, but nailed there like a dragonfly. The mantis recoiled. Suddenly, Phileno was on the mantis's back. It froze. Phileno flirted out his own wings, cape style. Come, Mr. Coy, we have business elsewhere. I'll show you how to use the new bits. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The mantis's wings rose behind him, and they flew into the night. After a pause, Chiswick said, Well, I see what you mean, Captain. Here, boy, take your mare back to the stables. Go slow, she's tired. I'm back to the cops while there's still some eggnog left. Chiswick launched off Zelda's back into the branches above and was gone. Vimont took her halter. She nuzzled him in the chest. Good girl, he murmured. Then to the company, thank you. Thank you all. There was a confused, cheerful chorus on the theme of you're welcome. Corno had picked up Coy's empty clothes. He looked at them thoughtfully, then tossed them into the back of the van. He gestured to the young satyrs to get in. As they obeyed, he said to the others, I will go back and pick up, and tell the others, if they have not felt it for themselves, and think what to do. Come to me in the morning, said Fletcher, and we'll see what can be done. Thank you. Sanders raised his phone. I'll call off the base patrols and the others. And then, Captain? Back to Whiffburn Hill, Fletcher declared, to relax a bit. Darcy knelt before Delahaye. Ma'am, would you like a ride back? Thank you, cavalrymen. We can go slower this time, though the gallop was thrilling. Corno paused, climbing into the van, and looked to Deirdre. She was still sitting on Vimont, but she had been shy around centaurs. Do you wish a ride back, miss? We will be polite. I'm sure of that, Deirdre replied. She squeezed Vimont's shoulder. But I have a ride. The end. Looking Forward The history lecture in Lecture Hall and Pub mentions that Prince Hugh, the founder of the dedicated cavalry, is still alive, but in his 90s as of 2017. So look a few years forward. So what is to be the theme for the prince's 100th birthday? A rodeo, sir. A rodeo? Yes, sir. 
and what is to be our part in the rodeo? Broncos, sir. Broncos, bucking Broncos. Yes, sir. And who will we be bucking? The standard cavalry, sir. Thought so. It seems a little ironic, after all the effort we go to keeping the jockey boys on our backs. Yes, sir, but I understand there's a certain amount of relish expressed by our lads, sir. Hmm. The standard cavalry folk do sometimes seem to confuse us with our simpler cousins. I understand the horses will be getting their licks in too, sir. Only fair. And I hope you have enjoyed the cavalry cycle. These images were created by Fia at Hubbity Hubby on Tumblr.